Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Church. I'm your host, Kenneth Westby, and this program is coming to you from the Great Pacific Northwest. And it's a beautiful day here on the Sabbath. I hope it is where you are as well and that you're resting and being refreshed because that's one of the purposes of God's Sabbath. It's a gift. <clears throat> uh, Jesus, in his own words, and his own way of putting things, said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that man is also Lord. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, well, what's that imply? Well, that implies that if it's made for him, it's for his use. Now, God made it holy, so he can't change what God has made holy but he can learn to live with it and honor it and in that sense carry forth the meaning of the Sabbath and we know the Sabbath is a multi-textured a deep principle of, of the word of God sure it involves physical rest and involves freedom from a, a lot of tasks it reminds us who God is he's our deliverer he's our savior but it also uh, has a shadow picturing a peaceful time for the whole world when the whole world will be at peace. So as if we live in a Sabbath world, uh, a restful world, God's rest, uh, we will be, in that sense, always uh, in the, pre the holy presence of God, which is what the Sabbath indicates one can be in it's then that God rested with man uh, on the Sabbath so there was a community and of course Adam was then the Lord of the earth so in a sense that he was Lord of the earth he was also Lord of the Sabbath that is to maintain it to teach it to live it to observe it to celebrate it uh, and Jesus indicated he was like the Son of Man, uh, he was likewise Lord of the Sabbath. So he was correcting those who had other ideas what the purpose of the Sabbath was, and he showed uh, beautifully by illustration and by contradiction of what was taking place around him, what the Sabbath truly was, a gift from God, a gift of life, a gift of rest, a gift of the very presence of God uh, in the future. In the great kingdom of God. So uh, that's a bit of an aside, but uh, here we are on the Sabbath, not on some other day, not that other days aren't godly days too, but this is a special day. And we honor that special day. And uh, one of the great ways to honor it is to fellowship and study His Word, and in that sense, uh, sup with uh, God Himself. So before we begin today, we'll ask the presence of the creator of the Sabbath to uh, inspire us and let this day be a, a changing day for us, a, a day of growth, shall we pray. Lord, Father above, God of the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath, you've given it to us, to, to mankind, to learn of you, to rest with you and have that hope for the future of a great rest for all of humanity. No war, no suffering, no worthless toil, but a time of great delight and purposeful building in the great and glorious kingdom that you have for us. Bless us now as we pause on the Sabbath, honoring you as Creator and Savior, honoring your Son who set the example of how we can become part of your kingdom and at your side and live forever. We ask you to inspire all of us today to lay aside our cares of this world and put our cares upon you and look forward to and lift our eyes heavenward to your glorious kingdom. We hope soon will come. We ask this blessing now and ask your favor in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, before we begin our main message on idolatry, 
uh, which I've chosen today, how we become like our idols. It sounds like an outrageous statement, but it's not, and I'll explain why as we get into it. But first, uh, a brief Sabbath thought from the book of Psalms, Psalm 89. If you'll turn to Psalm 89 with me, and we'll read along, uh, not the whole psalm, it's a rather long psalm, but we'll read a couple highlights it's not a psalm of David, by the way. It's a psalm of another fellow, uh, Ethan, who was an Ezraite. Uh, and he was a, a wise man, probably during the time of Solomon, regarded as uh, one who was a, a wise person, renowned for that wisdom. And uh, so he wrote this psalm and apparently found its way right here in the book of Psalms. And, uh, you know, no book in the Old Testament is quoted more often in the New Testament than the book of Psalms. And can you understand why? Well, Psalm 89, is, of course, uh, helps us understand why. Uh, it's one of many glorious uh, hymns of praise toward God, which sets the tone of true worship, true worship of the one true God. And it focuses on the uh, steadfast, uh, totally reliable, unmovable uh, promises of God. And uh, one in particular, uh, David. Uh, the David was always going to have a ruler over his throne until he, obviously through a resurrection, comes back uh, and rules on that throne again. Uh, it's a glorious promise, all, all expansive that reaches out generation and generation and generation. My, how far does it go? Well, it's still going on. Jesus referred to it uh, himself. Well, let's just notice a couple of verses here in Psalm 89. And when we're looking at things to read and places to uh, meditate upon, uh, no better place than the Psalms. Uh, and try to say in your own mind, could I say what this writer says, what does he have in mind? How does he mean it? Uh, and, and try to get the whole scope of it and, and understand the, the depth and the meaning behind it. In Psalm 89, uh, the uh, Ethan writes, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. The Lord's Yahweh is the word, uh, the covenant name of God. With my mouth I will make your fullness known through all generations. So here's a commitment that he will always sing. That is, it'll be a melody in his heart, uh, a joyful song to God. All of his days, he made that commitment uh, to God. And about what? Well, about God's great love. And is this normally what hits us between the eyes and in our frontal lobes when we think about God of his, of his great love well that means you have to understand something about God's character about his promises about what he's done to demonstrate that great love what are the evidences of his great love well, all these things can be seen uh, from scripture but it's that great love that had reached so deeply into the heart of Ethan that he said, you know, I'm just going to sing about that the rest of my days. That's the most important thing in the world. We we sometimes get enraptured about the love of a mate or a husband or a wife, or and people talk about how I'll always love you and to my death and so on. And and uh, it's like we're singing a a song of praise, and that's wonderful for another human being. Uh, it's kind of rare, but it's wonderful. It's a precious thing. Well, even more so here with the, with our maker, uh, the God who, who made us. And he says, with my mouth I'll make your faithfulness known through all generations. Well, he had his wish here. How many generations removed are we from Ethan? <laughs> well, we're still reading what he's saying, right? And uh, we're still meditating on his testimony about the faithfulness of God. Well, what did he have in mind? And why was this so moving uh, to Ethan that he could write this beautiful 
song, psalm. He says, I will declare that your love, verse 2, stands firm forever, that it is a sta- that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. So he's showing the absolute anchoring and permanence of the commitments God makes. And uh, he said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever. I will make your throne firm through all generations. So is there still a throne of David waiting for him? Well, apparently there is. And uh, God says that David is going to sit on it. And uh, Jesus Christ will, in a sense, be David's king as David reigns over Israel. Uh, The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, verse 5, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. So it acknowledges that there are other beings up there, other powerful angelic spirit beings, uh, but then there's only one uh, God. There's only one who's above them all, and uh, he stands forever. If if Yahweh were just one deity among other deities, a whole pantheon of deities, well, his plans could be interrupted by one of the others, uh, short-stopped by one of the others, interfered with, canceled, overcome by some of the other gods, uh, equal gods up there in the pantheon, but that's not the case here. Uh, there's only one God who stands above all other powers, all other spirits. And that's what he says here. Verse 7, The council of the holy ones, um, in the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. So who is it that they reverence and fear? God, all the holy ones. This be the angels, and, and you might even say the demonic powers that have been cast out. Yeah, they fear too. Uh, They fear the retribution. Uh, The angels uh, fear and reverence and love and and to please God. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Well, that's a kind of a picture, isn't it? Picture of God and heaven. It's hard for us to do maybe, but He's surrounded by all these powerful beings, angelic beings that uh, have superhuman powers uh, that could do amazing things on the earth. They could cause earthquakes, move mountains, uh, do whatever. Uh, And yet God stands above them all, and they all uh, beckon uh, his word. The Lord God Almighty, who is like you, and this is a verse to uh, to ponder, verse 8 of Psalm 89. O Lord, Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim, Almighty, who is like you? You might say that's a rhetorical question. Obviously, none. You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. It just... What you are, everything about you is truth, honor, faithfulness, uh, your very your very character, and a word that keeps coming up uh, all the time here is this word for steadfast love or faithfulness. It's the Hebrew word has said. It's a rather hard word to translate with one word. It's just it's just about impossible. It's a beautiful word, probably one of the most beautiful words in the Hebrew has said uh, and it can be translated as uh, unfailingly loyal that God is to his servants persevering love that a, a love that lasts a lot of disappointments and perseveres my what God went through with Israel and does he still have a covenant with Israel yes he does amazingly and grace of God just the generosity that's attached to this faithfulness uh, of God. 
Uh, that's all summarized in that, that one word there of steadfast love or has said. And this is the way he, he deals with his children. It's just uh, quite, quite amazing. Uh, verse 11, the heavens are yours, and yours also is the earth, everything. You founded the world and all that's in it. You created a north and south. <laughs> yeah, who sets the, uh, the magnetic north and, and south? Well, certainly I don't. No scientist does. Uh, but it's a powerful uh, thing. And he talks about the righteousness and justice of your throne, verse 14. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. So th there's uh, a process of learning. How is it we learn to actually worship God, to attune to Him? Uh, interesting words here some translations have it blessed are those who have learned to know the trumpet sound I think that's the revised standard version or blessed are those who know know the joyful sound you might say of the trumpet sound uh, to listen to God listen to his announcements blessed are those who have learned to do that is that something you learn it is to be sensitive to have ears that hear eyes that see understanding that perceives that's who he's calling who walk in the light of your presence in other words they search for the light and then walk in it the presence of God which emanates his righteousness in other words it's a way to live it's a way to think uh, it's your future, it's your past, it's who you are, it's what you shall be. Everything summarized in God. Uh, th this is sometimes called the, uh, the biblical doctrine of, of God. And uh, most statements of faith, and I've read hundreds of them from different churches over the years, and they'll generally start, rightly so, with point number one, God. And then they'll make their statement who God is, what He's two people or three people or whatever, uh, and they'll go on from there. But the theology of God, the doctrine of God, is the most important doctrine uh, in all Scripture. I mean, we have to start with knowing who made us and what did he make us for and what is the light of his path that we're, into, we're, we're to walk therein. Now, these are the, all summarized by knowing God. Uh, the path that he's chosen emanates from his very character. Well, what is he like? What is his character? What is his righteousness? What are his commandments, his principles, his expectations for us? Well, then we know how to walk. And uh, so this is where it all starts. Like I said, people sometimes wonder why are we doing these uh, nature of God, nature of Christ seminars because this is the most important piece of knowledge we can have. Everything else hangs from it. Like Jesus said about the uh, the greatest commandment there, Mark 1. Hear, O Israel, and he's quoting from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord God is one. And we're to worship him with all of our mind, our soul, our being, strength, Every part of us, our intellect, uh, our hopes, our dreams, our emotions, our strength, our wealth, everything. Uh, so Jesus said, that's the greatest commandment, <laughs> none of the greater. And on that, everything else hangs. So why not start with what's most important? And w where has mankind gone wrong, if not right here? In not knowing who God is and substituting idols and non-gods and fables and anti-god ideas for the one true God. And so they don't have a path to walk because they blinded their eyes to the one true God. Uh, they, the blessed ones, rejoice in your name all day long, verse 16. So it's, it's a thought once you put it in your mind in the morning it's a thought you can think about all day long. That is, 
how loving God is and how good he is and about his creation and how marvelous it is. Just saw some pictures this last week on the uh, these butterfly nebula that they pictured out there and the way the, the light and the, uh, uh, the the rays and the electromagnetic forces and everything else transfer the this space between these giant nebula out there uh, with all the colors and everything it does look like a couple of multicolored beautiful butterfly wings amazing thing just sort of sitting out there who knows how many hundreds and light years away it is but uh, the the cosmos is full of that people will wonder wonder what God's been doing before he made man well just get a telescope and look around our God is a creator God he's always been creating he's never stopped creating he's creating right now Now, this is who God is and the things he does are beautiful and he's made them for his children it's like a lot of loving parents they do what they do in life and accumulate what they accumulate for their children because they love their children and uh, and God even more so and he writes in verse 16 the blessed ones they exalt in your righteousness yeah they, they think about the, the God's law how good and pure and right and how it makes sense and how every evil you can see out in society is the result of that beautiful sensible logical pure law of god being ignored and broken and uh, and and this truth can resonate and of course can change lives as as well so this is a good example of the doctrine of god uh psalm 89 um the lord almighty who is like you you are mighty o yahweh and your faithfulness surrounds us and does it surround you and the promises? What are the promises for you and me? If not promises just like he gave David, just like he gave Jesus, eternal life in his glorious kingdom. Well, I mentioned on our website and I mentioned last week, we are planning our uh, 13th annual, I believe it's our 13th annual uh, nature of God, Nature of Christ seminar, sometimes called the One God seminars. And uh, that's going to be held uh, here in Renton, Washington at the Red Lion Hotel. And that's November 7 and 8. It's a weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Hope you can make it. Got a good deal with the hotel. Their rooms are normally, I think, close to around 200 or more dollars a night. We're getting it for $98, those of you that would be coming from out of town. Got some new speakers slated um, and a lot of new material. Uh, so it is just, you know, rehashing what's been hashed before, although a lot of that's good and needs repeating. But uh, introducing new material always. Because how expansive is the doctrine of God? Uh, well, there's no end to it. No end to it at all. And in these seminars, uh, I might add, we don't just... Um, you know, reaffirm everything we all know, and so we all feel good like a Sunday school class uh, where we just sort of go over the lesson for the week, and yeah, we believe that, and this is why we do it. Isn't that wonderful? And let's go home. Uh, no, it, it challenges our thinking, uh, stretches our minds, and uh, some things maybe you won't agree with, but it'll stir up some thinking on your part and challenge some paradigms that you may have in your mind that have been stuck there for a long time. Do they belong there? Do those paradigms belong there? I was just discussing with my friend Noel Rood on the phone here the other day. Uh, one of the subjects he wants to bring up is on the covenants. Say, so well, yeah, we all know about that. It's the old covenant that's done away. we got the new covenant now. And, you know, what's... No, no, no. That's not it at all. Uh, and he's presenting some uh, very biblically f uh, founded, and uh, the proof is pretty strong 
judge for yourself, but uh, the covenant God made with Israel is still in force. And it's going to be fulfilled. And the new covenant is actually not yet uh, instituted. It shall be, but it's not yet. And uh, there are a couple of marriages associated uh, figurative marriages because marriage is like a covenant uh, it's a commitment uh, associated I Israel made a commitment to God and God made a commitment to Israel that he would regard Israel as his wife but she must be faithful to him well we know how that went but did God give up and finally destroy Israel or is he going to be forgiving and ultimately hang in there and bring Israel back into that relationship and unite divided Israel, Judah, and the ten tribes of Israel at some time in the future, perhaps uh, right at the very end of man's rule? Well, those are good questions, and the Bible does speak to them. And, and Jesus, is he making a covenant? Yeah. Who's he making a covenant with? Well, with his bride. Well, who's his bride? Well, it's New Jerusalem. Where's New Jerusalem? It's in heaven. It's coming down from heaven. What's all that about? Well, it's about the saints and about who comprises the bride of Christ and what their reward is going to be. And is it the same for all of them? Well, apparently not. Uh, anyway, these are some questions that will be brought up but uh, if you think you know the story of the covenants um, come have your uh, your your uh, ideas challenged uh, on that and maybe get some new information that might be helpful it all ties in with the faithfulness of God so that's scheduled for November 7 and 8 I hope you can uh, make it and um well, here are our um, main message, I guess I call it our main message today. I've uh, entitled, uh, We Become What We Worship, or You Become What You Worship, and I Become What I Worship. Well, how's that work? Uh, we wonder, well, what is the, the genesis or the origin of all the problems we have around us today and the problems in the world and the rest? Where did a lot of that uh, come from? We know God hates idolatry. We know there are commandments in the Ten Commandments against idolatry. But we say, hey, we don't have idols today. I don't know anybody that sets up an idol in his room and bows down and worship it, worship them, although some still do, actually. Um, but, you know, idol worship can take many forms. An idol is anything that you put before the true God or in place of the true God that's important to you uh, and the idol displaces a God and the idol then becomes the way in which one can avoid God and go another direction under the permission of of the idol or whatever the cultural aspect of that idol is and we see that all around us in our own uh, culture today of what's taking place and it goes back to uh, ancient Israel of course they had the struggles with idolatry and uh, they always went back to the same pattern and when they went in the same pattern the same things repeated uh, and the Apostle Paul in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 10 talks about idolatry then and what the natural result of that idolatry is that when people turn away from the one true God that we read about there in Psalm 89 uh, to idols, something happens. Idols could be anything, anything you, empty things. You, the Bible calls them vain. That is, they, they have an emptiness to them. There's, there's no reality. Uh, they don't speak. They don't think. Uh, but nevertheless, they're important to people. And so people pay homage to them. You say, well, I don't see much of that going on today. Well, don't we? Are there not symbols all over 
and the golden calf was nothing more than a symbol, a symbol of another way of life, uh, another uh, moral universe that they experienced in Egypt, which was a whole lot more free to their lusts uh, than was the were the commandments of God, uh, which he gave there at uh, Mount Horeb or, or Sinai. And so when they saw that, a lot of them thought, well, you know, <laughs> the, these gods back in Egypt and their way of life and everything else, uh, I kind of yearn for that. And are we ready for following God? And then, you know, these terrible things happen. You say, well, a lot of people to this day have a hard time believing how the people brought out of Egypt by the hand of God could have gone back to worshiping idols and a golden calf when they're fresh out of Egypt, when they've seen the deliverance of God, how this could happen. Well, people, you know, uh, they have eyes, but they don't always see reality with those eyes. All they see is the step ahead of them and things that happen, and they're they're quick to come up with other explanations and uh, or to attribute other factors for their deliverance rather than God. Uh, this is uh, a deflection that happens so easily. We see it today in politics. Uh, we have certain realities that seem totally on the surface to be common sense, and yet politicians will deflect from that and try to come up with a totally other opposite reason for the problem. Now, whether it's the degeneracy and the backwardness and the uh, the cultural rot that's in a lot of the inner cities with the breakdown of the family and illegitimacy and absent fathers and the absence of moral teaching uh, and the, this being the reason uh, for rampant crime and murder and disrespect for human life, disrespect for women and so on. Rather than saying that as a logical consequence, they'll say, oh, no, no, that's not the reason, no. It's racism, slavery, 150 years ago it's caused this. Uh, or or we don't have enough jobs, as if the government's supposed to open up some chute somewhere and a bunch of jobs drop down, and as soon as those jobs hit the ground, well, there'd be peace and utopia uh, for the lazy guys sitting around the street smoking dope and uh, talking big and looking for trouble. Uh, no, we got to import a lot of people from uh, south of the border to do jobs Americans won't do. Oh, well, why won't they do them? Oh, it's because they're receiving a lot of welfare and they don't have to. Oh, is it, could that be part of the problem? That we've got a welfare-dependent society that we're nurturing some of this corruption? I mean, these are logical conclusions. No, 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 that's not it. It's racism. They're being held down. Uh, and it's jobs, it's econ economic development. They need more economic development. They need more of these big evil corporations to come in and build nice hotels and fancy gentrified neighborhoods in these slum ghettos. And then everything's going to be fine. Uh, that's what we need, economic development, more federal money, more jobs, uh, and uh, less brutal police. You know, that's a problem. T too many brutal police. They're, they're uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. Just read a uh, disturbing article the other day. It's on Mauritania, uh, that West African black uh, country uh, that uh, still practices slavery big time. There are between uh, four and 500,000 blacks enslaved. I mean, actual slavery in Mauritania. And who are they enslaved by? Well, some by other blacks, but mainly by Arabs and Berbers uh, who regard blacks as inferior and are worthy of a slave class. And of course, this has been part of the uh, Islamic Arab thinking from the beginning. That's why Sharia law has a lot of uh, talk, spends a lot of time talking about how slaves are to be managed. Yeah, slavery is allowed in Sharia law. And uh, so all these blacks being enslaved over there, horribly treated, 
uh, miserable conditions and supported by the government, which is all run by these same people, uh, basically the Arabs and the Berbers and the Is Islamics, of course. Um, and the story about this one uh, guy, brave fellow, uh, black gentleman who uh, was like a one-man campaign against slavery. And uh, you think, well, w this is going on in 2015 uh, in this African nation, which only officially a few years ago outlawed slavery. They did that basically to appease uh, the rest of the world, but it's still practiced. And uh, it's terrible what's going on. And the biggest slave tra traders in, in all history were not the plantation owners down in Virginia who simply bought product, you might say, which is evil. Uh, but it was the Arab world. They were the largest. They traded more slaves, sold more stra slaves, uh, and not just black slaves, but that was their main uh, trade, but also white slaves that they could get out of Europe. In fact, the word slave comes from uh, the word Slav, which were the white Slavs that they brought down and made slaves out of. Slavery is a part of Islam, very much a part of Islam. But do we hear much about that today? Oh, no, it's a religion of peace and, you know, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And all these black lives people, are they really concerned about black lives? How about their black lives over in Africa that are being enslaved by the hundreds of thousands right now? Not slavery 150 years ago, right now. What are they doing about it? You know, the big old fat cats are going around in their limousines, uh, you know, shake down corporations to get money and living uh, high and mighty, and they don't care about the how many get killed in the ghetto because, you know, they just blame that on racism, blame it on uh, something else. So, you know, you can have logical facts out there and come up with other reasons uh, for it. Well, Israel did the same thing, apparently some of them. There's places the nose on their face. There was some divine deliverance going on, and, uh, and Moses was an instrument of God in that, and they're free. They were slaves in Egypt. Now they're free. Uh, but there are some things they're going to miss. And there are some things they're going to have to ch change. And they're not so sure they want to do it. In the book of uh, Habakkuk, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, and he's similar to Isaiah and some of Isaiah's comments. But... Uh, he talks about the manufacture of false idols which are placed in idolatrous temples and how that's contrasted with the true God and his true temple. And today, do we have temples of pleasure <laughs> and temples dedicated to uh, the various lusts of the flesh? No, sure, with all the symbols that go with it, you know whether it's the rainbow symbol or the the pink or whatever it is. They got all kind of symbols uh, for uh, man love and uh, for same-sex marriage. And, and, you know, they got a heart with the infinity through it. And, yeah, they have all the little idol symbols uh, of their uh, new faith or new religion. But here's what uh, Habakkuk uh, says. Uh, what profit is the idol when the maker has carved it? Or an image, a teacher of falsehood? You know, do these images teach truth, truth of God? No. For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Do they actually give out any new information, any wisdom? Uh, no, they don't. They have speakers for them. It's like with evolution. They have their priests who speak for evolution, what evolution means, what it means to us uh, religiously. It means religiously that there is no God and that uh, we make God in our own image however we want. And it speaks to us socially. There are no rules of right and wrong, uh, whether it be uh, sexual rules or any other rules because we're just animals that have evolved, mammals that have evolved, and we've, we determine our own social constructs. 
and, and we can choose whatever we want because there's no higher authority. We're just evolving. Uh, this is They have teachers, yes. They have high priests for evolution that teach these things. They're in our schools. They're in our universities. And they teach the way they speak for the idol of evolution, which is what it is. Um, Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, or to a mute stone, Arise. Uh, and that and that is your teacher? <laughs> Habakkuk says. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there's no breath at all inside of it. It's just empty. It is vain. Uh, and all these religions uh, are vain, whether it's the big fat Buddhas that people gather around, or the Shinto shrines, and uh, Vishnu, and all the rest. And we're not talking about a couple of people. We're talking about, well, India now is becoming the largest population country on earth. We're talking well over a billion people and others that have rallied around various idols and shrines, uh, you know, spinning prayer wheels and the rest, paying homage, uh, whether it's to the Koran, they circle around there in Mecca, this black obelisk, uh, and pay homage to it and the great pilgrimage to that idol uh, that's nothing more than idolatry and the symbol on their flag is the, the moon and the sword well sure uh, the, is it the real God they're called the monotheistic religion absolute nonsense their God is the, the moon God uh, terrible but Habakkuk, Habakkuk says, but Yahweh is in his temple. Yeah, he's, he's not some idol somewhere that's silent. No, he's in his temple. And let the earth be silent before him. In other words, listen to him. Does God speak? Yes. Does he commission prophets? Yes. Do they write his words? Yes. Are his works manifest in creation? Absolutely everywhere. Do they tell the story? A powerful story uh, but uh, uh, people want idols because the idols can teach falsehood in other words the priesthood of these idols can teach whatever they they want and of course they do going back now to the book of uh, Exodus turn with me to Exodus uh, 32 And we see this repeated in, in 1 Kings. But this is back at the time of the Exodus. Uh, and it says in verse 4, He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a carving tool and made it like a bolt and calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, you know, Aaron giving them what they wanted. Is that one way to placate the mobs? They have quickly turned aside, verse 8, uh, from the way I've, I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They revel, they, uh, reveal that the calf uh, was gold. The idol was gold. Uh, so God was very displeased with that, displeased enough that he was willing to start over with Moses as a result. In First Kings, we see the thing repeated. Now, now, you say they did learn a lesson there with that calf business. Apparently they did for a while, but it was still part of the psyche that if they wanted to get away from God, they had to have a, a substitute. And in this case, the, uh, the this golden uh, calf, uh, and they likened Israel to being a stiff-necked people, just like a calf, an unruly calf, that was going to dart off whatever way it wanted to, could not be restrained. And he used that term, stiff-necked, uh, to Israel in, in regards to this thing. 
Well, here in 1 Kings 12 is a parallel passage. And this is now after there were kings in Israel. This is down the roadways hundreds of years later. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, Telling them the same lie uh, that, uh, you know, it was these golden calf gods that, you know, down in Egypt, that these are the ones that came up with you. They're the ones that brought you out. And it's too hard to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, we'll set these right up here. And they did. He set them up in uh, Bethel, town of Bethel, and set the other up in Dan. Made it convenient. So if you want a convenient religion where you don't have to travel too far, go down that temple in Jerusalem with the, the tribe of Judah down there, you stay up here. We, we can put together a convenient religion uh, for you. Um, and in First Kings uh, 12, and verse 29, continuing, he set one up in Bethel and put the other in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people, and the people went to worship uh, before the one as far as Dan. And they made houses and high places, made priests from among the people who were not the sons of Levi. So he ordained a whole other priesthood. Uh, forgot all the conventions. Uh, you know, the priests of Levi uh, were to be the ones that ministered in the temple, uh, that handled the oracles of God. Uh, he said, but get rid of that. Get rid of this Yahweh uh, thing. We set up some golden calves. You got this in your memory bank. Uh, and it was down in Egypt, which means we don't have to follow that harsh law of God, as they would say. We can do a lot of other things that we want to do anyway, and it's more convenient. We don't have to travel on down there. So Jeroboam was the guy, and this the sin of Jeroboam is mentioned often because it's sort of the quintessential turning away from God instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month. Um, when is the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, it's on the 15th day of the seventh month. So he's kind of copying it, but twisting it, making it different. Uh, he, and he went up to the altar and he set the example for the people and he made offerings and uh, burned incense and all the rest and basically turned the worship around uh, in a bad uh, direction. And back in Exodus 32, when Aaron saw this uh, that they wanted, he built an altar for it and made a proclamation. He said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings, peace offerings, and they sat down to eat and rose up to play. And apparently that rose up to play was uh, likened to, as a number of commentaries say, an orgy of sorts. It's like they now were free and they threw off the burden and uh, they could just party. And after all, Moses was been up in that mountain a long time. How quick we forget. You know, they've kind of forgotten Moses, but um, God was seeing all this. And so the Lord spoke to Moses. Verse 7, he said, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Corrupted themselves. And uh, there are so many passages here in the Old Testament that show that uh, Israel's sin and capitulation, uh, like under Jeroboam, uh, led to a corruption, and that they become then very much like the idols that they worship, vain, empty, worthless. Uh, they exchanged, as it says, the glory of God for that which is nothing. And this is a, a cheap exchange uh, that people do uh, when they forsake the true God. 
and they'll they'll try to make replacements you know whether it's this religion or that religion and uh, they'll try to dress it up as much as they can and and have priests and robes and and um, make it seem like they're really doing the right thing uh, but they're they're not and uh, later on in second kings it shows they did the same thing again and of course they ended up losing their land and being carried into captivity and they never returned well Paul here in the New Testament 1 Corinthians 10 uh, says this whole business of turning to idols and another way and of course we can substitute a lot of things back in uh, Jesus time uh, he was talking about the idolatry of the tradition that they were letting the tradition which was wrong a, a corrupt tradition teaching the commandments and teachings of men uh, that we're going to perish with the use as Jesus uh, said um, and as uh, Paul and Colossians uh, reiterated uh, these were the things that became then the, the idols uh, of the people but here's the shocking statements in 1 Corinthians 10 19 Paul says it's more than meets the eye there's a demonic aspect uh, to the reality behind uh, idols and again idol worship is anything you put before the true God displacing him and giving your allegiance to and honor to it and uh, a lot of people today that's it's their cultural world it's their materialism uh, it's their false religions that they abide in or their new spirituality uh, that they place uh, first and of course then they they dabble in all these other weird spiritualities trying to uh, trying to uh, put you know lipstick on the pig make it look better Paul writes what do we mean then that a thing sacrificed to uh, idols is anything or that the idol is anything no the idol is never anything uh, no I say to you what the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to God so when they pay homage to whatever their idols are and they make their offerings their food offerings and all the rest uh, really what they're doing is they're dealing down and paying homage to demons. They, they may not recognize this in their own mind, but that's what they've been conned into doing. And Paul says it's, uh, it's true. He says they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become sharers in demons. So Paul is telling people in those days, because idol worship was rampant, uh, in the days of the early church as they were moving out through the Greek Hellenistic world which is full of idols everywhere you turn there was an idol Romans are full of idols and standards and rest of their their gods you know Jupiter Olympus and the rest of them Paul says you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons so e either you're all in for God or you're all in for the world and its idols and its substitutes uh, for God, one way or the other. He says you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Now that's pretty stark. Do you really understand what he's saying? A lot of people don't. They think, oh, that's a bunch of hyperbole from first century uh, people who are superstitious. No, I think Paul had a, a good handle on things. It's we today that uh, are sometimes blinded and we don't see the evil reality upon the movements and trends in our world and culture and what's really taking place. Similarly, uh, a number of passages in the book of Revelation, you know, John's book of Revelation, which is basically the revelation of Jesus Christ, directly link idolatry with demons. See that in Revelation 2, uh, Revelation 9, 16, and so on. Don't have time to 
get into it. Uh, and Jesus dealt with uh, demons in the Gospels. And they were active in Jesus' uh, day, trying to influence uh, Israel in the wrong direction. He confronted them, overpowered them, and basically told them to shut up. And they, of course, had to obey him. Um, and, of course, in the book of Romans, uh, we see this uh, spelled out probably as starkly as we're going to find it anywhere else, and we'll close with with that in Romans 1, uh, verses 20 through 28. It's uh, Paul's most explicit elaborations on idolatry, and it affirms, uh, you know, the, the following, that there's a principle involved. We tend to become like what we worship. That is what we hold up as important to us. Uh, we tend to follow that. And it becomes our way of thinking. It becomes our morality. And we become like that. And people wonder, well, what happened to the morality in the country? What happened to uh, marriage? What what happened to truth and honesty and patriotism or any thing that you could liken to as being like a, a healthy emotion. Well, now we have an attack of trying to remove God from everything, from the Pledge of Allegiance to every courthouse, uh, uh, out of school, Bible, prayer, whatever it else, because something else has to be substituted for God. And we can't have God around, so he's got to be removed. And another God set up another idol, and that idol can be a concept, it can be a, a theory, um, and generally it it's, has to do with something of creation, because people like to anchor it somewhere in creation, and uh, of course much of the whole environmental movement is nothing more than a, a religious movement, uh, save the earth, mother earth, mother Gaia, uh, the earth, and that is the most noble thing, and that man and a lot of books and writings come out on this all the time from leftists and, and uh, radical environmentalists. That man is the evil. He's the interloper. And the earth would be a whole lot better off with less of man. And a lot of these great you know, professors and elites and the rest think the best thing in the world would be if the human population could be reduced to about 100 million. Some say 500 million. Well, what's that mean? Well, it's basically kill off around 7 billion humans. And the earth would be a better place. There would be more room for tigers and more room for uh, leopards and more room for snails and more room for birds and reptiles and, uh, you know, all the other marvelous uh, things that people like to rally around and save. And they're desperate about it. You know, the earth now is being destroyed with uh, climate change, as if climate change is some sort of new thing. Come on, idiots. Climate's always been changing. There's no real evidence, solid evidence at all, other a couple of uh, dreamed-up computer models that have been proven pretty, pretty unreliable and projected way out, and none of them have come true with any of their proje projections. Uh, that it's caused by man's activity uh, but that's the idea that man is the evil destroyer when well, we've got to regulate man and save the earth because it's the earth that we need to uh, worship it's our bodies uh, that are that need to be fulfilled that cannot be restrained by laws of God and morality and traditions and so on and so whatever it is, they, they want this freedom, freedom from God, uh, basically. And this is what I was talking about here in, in, in Romans. And he, um, he goes back to the origin of things. He said, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is God's, his eternal power, his divine nature, has been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. Uh, so that they are without excuse. So if they really thought it through, they they couldn't come up with these silly ideas like the theory of, of evolution. 
or like man uh, is the interloper and the evil and the odd man out on earth. It was the exact opposite. God said to Adam, the earth is yours. You have dominion over it. Well, I made it, you know, God says, it's my earth, but I've given you dominion over it. And, of course, it's the exact opposite today. They're saying, well, no, man shouldn't have any dominion. It belongs to the animals. It belongs to nature. And they're noble. We're, we're ignoble. He goes on, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Now, as the generation came out of the Exodus, uh, do they know the handiworks of God? Were they saved? Yes. Did they give him thanks? No, apparently. But became futile in their speculations. Um, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, when you get a darkened heart, nothing makes sense it all comes out wrong and it says they exchanged professing to be wise of course they became fools and this is basically the faculty in a lot of our schools today not all of them of course some of the hard sciences are still pretty straight up uh, but by and large much of the rest of the thinking the philosophy and uh, the sociology and uh, all the governmental studies and all that stuff Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. So they exchanged something glorious, the maker of everything, beautiful, righteous, perfect, uh, now to certain aspects of his creation. And we're going to worship them rather than the Creator. Uh, talk about a terrible thing. So God says, all right, if you're going to walk forth in your darkened minds, this is what you can expect. So God gave them over, which always means he lets them run in their determined direction. Over to the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. Yeah, it never works. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. So then it goes on to show that God gave them to, over to degrading passions. Uh, homosexuality is mentioned prominently. So Paul here in Romans affirms that idol worship is the root sin of all of the sins and when one turns from trust in God to some other trust to some other enthusiasm uh, his heart becomes darkened and with that darkened heart follow all sorts of uh, sins and the essential nature of idolatry is explained in that exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God for for something else, for an image. Exchanging the truth of God, which is a beautiful, precious thing we try to preserve, and what we try to spend our time talking about here every week, for a lie. Now, are there lies out there? Uh, the world's full of them. And worshiping and serving the cre creature rather than the creator. Well, if this doesn't describe evolution, I don't know what does. Yeah, it's the creature. It's the created thing uh, that we're, we're worshiping rather than the creator. So the fitting punishment for this malfunction of human beings in worshiping, turning from worshiping God, is a malfunction in relationships, which, of course, includes homosexuality lesbianism, disobedience to parents, all, all kinds of dysfunctional relationships with others. It's what we're seeing in a culture. It's not total, but it's there. And the punishment uh, fits the crime. For not honoring God, God let their bodies be dishonored among themselves. And similarly, the penalty for not approving to have God in their knowledge, fittingly, is to give them over to an unapproved mind, 
They won't approve to have God in their knowledge. So God says, all right, you live with your unapproved mind, a mind not approved by God. That is a mind filled with things unapproved by God, which, of course, would mean an awful lot of lies, unnatural relationships, which re resemble an unnatural relationship with God. And so they're, in a sense, punished by their own sins. They suppress the truth. They suppress the knowledge of God and the attributes of God's beautiful, perfect, righteous nature. And they have to live with the result. And they live unrighteously. And I was talking to a man the other day about how quickly, and he was amazed at how quickly uh, things have changed uh, morally in our country. Well, things can change real fast once that the mind becomes darker and darker and uh, that's what we're seeing in our culture is it too late to turn around well no it's not too late uh, there's always the opportunity of repentance and that repentance can be uh, can be there and uh, we have to have that kind of above the earth bird's eye view of the, uh, God's view of things and, and realize that repentance is possible if a people do turn. And that's why we're told to um, pray for the direction of our nation, that it may go well with us with Christianity, which is now under onslaught uh, around the world to be eliminated. It's been eliminated one nation after another. And now through laws and through courts and through philosophy and through evolutionary thinking, and the lies perpetrated by a, a, a decadent culture trying to eliminate Christianity in our world today. And a person can't even have Christian feelings and say, I won't bake a cake for a, to celebrate a homosexual marriage, and he's in violation of the law and penalized thousands of dollars and driven out of business. Uh, would this have happened uh, 30 years ago, 50 years ago? Not on your life. No, the darkened mind uh, is producing these kinds of results. God has let us pay for the price of our own national sins. And it all begins by idolatry, by moving away from God and substituting something else. And we know that something else is man's uh, way, man's new religion. And uh, it's a pathetic path. That's a path we can turn from. Uh, the Israelites learned the hard way that the golden calf didn't save them from anything. It just brought them more trouble. Well, thank you for tuning in today, and uh, we'll look forward to the uh, return of our virtual church next week. And uh, we'll close today with um, instrumental tune and uh, on how great thou art. Uh, join me as we pray our father in heaven we thank you that we don't have to look to worthless idols fashioned by our hand worthless concept empty vain philosophies that are grounded in lies and not the truth that this earth this world this universe this cosmos was made by you uh, a creator it's intelligent in its design and it's beautiful and all created things are the result of your design and we're to worship you and honor you and give you full full worth uh, and appreciation and praise for what you've done and you'll lead us in a righteous path uh, not in perversions not in sins that are going to entangle us and make us unhappy and make us miserable and corrupt us but the exact opposite uh, free us uh, give us lives that are full of your righteousness and your way to take on your image for if we worship you we shall become like you in mind and spirit if we worship this world and its ways and its philosophies and its idols we will become like it thank you father for giving us 
a direction to move Godward. We ask your blessing and dismissal now in Jesus' name. Amen.